as we go through the debate, and a number of uh, answers we can give, which I think will satisfactorily answer some of the concerns you got. But I think I'd rather go through and explain what our thinking is and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, if I do that first, then we can perhaps pick up stuff during questions. But a number of things you said there, I think we have a very, very substantial answer for quite a lot of particular things we've been trying to do. Now, so the council I lead has a clear vision for the local community. We want Neum to be a major business location, a place where people choose to live, work and stay. Now we're clear about the value that business contributes, whether it's the large international firms like Westfield opening the new shopping centre in Stratford City, which I hope you've all been to and shopped at, it's a very good experience, or small businesses which, which operate throughout the borough, giving Neum a strong reputation for small business. And, and we work hard to attract business to the borough to work with them, to provide employment to local people, and to help them develop. We're among the fastest councils in London for turning around planning applications, because we think it's important that business is supported. And private landlords are a growing business group in Newham, and play a significant role in housing provision in the borough, and a valued role. So I know, I know many of you will have concerns about our proposals for licensing, but I ask you to consider our approach, understanding that Newham is a borough that wants to work with and support the private sector. And let me also say at the outset that I know that landlords who are members of professional landlords associations such as the NLA, and we encourage people to join the NLA, the hosts of this evening, are the good landlords. And that the way the NLA has engaged with us on our existing selective licensing scheme has, whilst we've had our disagreements, been by and large constructive. Um, and I hope that we can continue, as we can sell the licensing package, that I believe will be good for good landlords, as well as important for responding to bad landlords. Now, new residents deserve uh, access to high quality affordable housing, including family housing, whether they're renting in the social service sector or the private sector, or want to own their own home. Uh, the private rented sector is an important part of our local community. Uh, nationally, around 16% of people live in rented housing. But in Newham, that figure has been growing steadily over the last decade as the sector replaces on our occupiers. Now our private housing is over a third of our housing stock. 135,000 private rented properties out of 103,000, and that is more than double the national average. I believe we are the top in the country. I stand to be corrected on that, but I think that's why, if you look at the graph on the right, which it is now, 35% above. The one place you might say that we're national is Canning Town. And the reason we're not at the national levels is because the council owns it, most of Canning Town. So if you want to look at an area that, that it shows a slide there, the darker the purple, the more private rented housing there is, you can clearly see the shift between 2001 and 2009 on the right, and it is continuing. It is not going to stop, it is continuing. So when we talk about selective, just look down that right-hand side and say, if you think in terms of London, that's a selective area. Because that, the level of private rented stock is enormous and is increasing rapidly in the borough. And that's something we're aware of. And for many people, that's because renting can be a positive choice. It provides flexibility as the family grows or the need to move to look for work, but it does also bring challenges. Population churn is very high in this sector. Over 40% of people living in the sector don't live uh, at their address last year. And where you've got kids, that can be extremely difficult in terms of how you approach it as a family. And given how common six month tendencies are, we believe the real level of churn is higher. I have to say, we've done some data analysis, and we'd have to go and check it, we haven't checked, but on our data analysis, we have properties with 55 people living in them. We have the smallest number of Band D plus properties in London, so they aren't big properties. 50 people we have recorded in various places. And that does cause very real community problems, like antisocial behaviour, rubbish from overcrowded properties, mattresses in every street, and noise nuisance. And it's something that we, as a council, have to respond to. Uh, the quality of a significant percentage of landlords is also an issue. Remember I said, the landlords here are likely to be the good landlords. We understand that. But around a quarter in our neighbourhood improvement zone in Little Elford, around a quarter operate cash in hand. And that's a good proxy for poor business practices. 
They fail to manage tenancies effectively and it leads to associated knock-on negative impacts for residents and communities. That's a quarter of landlords in the Little Ilford area that we did as a pilot, a quarter operating cash in hand. Uh, now, as I said before, I do not believe that NLA landlords and those with affiliation with other professional landlord bodies, I believe they by and large they behave well. I firmly believe that licensing can help you. I don't think it's a bad story for the good landlords. But I think you'd be shocked by some of what we see in Newham. The record physically for going into property and finding people in a property, the record currently stands at 38 people, including 16 children, living in a single family house. That is unacceptable. It is unacceptable to me, it is unacceptable to my residents, and it is morally unacceptable that we allow that position to continue. And I'd ask you, I, what is not caring about the facilities made available for tenants look like? What does overcrowding look like? What does poor management of properties look like? Well, let me show you what I think it looks like. There we are. Two tenants renting a commercial walk-in freezer in a basement. A freezer they're renting. Nine other tenants sharing the three remaining rooms. Kitchen and bathroom is external to main building. Dangerous to let This tenant was sleeping in the kitchen. Yeah. There's that. These are, oh, I could, loads of these. Uh, this was a shared kitchen with 11 occupiers using these facilities in a lean-to structure. A lean-to structure. And I have to say that we are currently... Put, we put a million pounds by just to go and rip these things down. And we're taking very significant enforcement action on it, but it's a real challenge. Here's one. Vulnerable occupiers use these poorly maintained properties with no heating or hot water and a collapsed ceiling. Basement room was used, being used to occupy a single tenant paying 50 pounds a week. There you are. No windows, no fixed seating, dangerous stairs, no smoke alarms. This property, while well, undergoing extensive, extensive building works, was occupied by 11 tenants. No roof, no windows to the first and second floors, floor surfaces missing, live wires exposed, three to four tenants sharing rooms as strangers. Shared houses occupied by 22 adults, with five to six occupiers sharing this room, and all the tenants had to share one kitchen. Now, that's not the properties you rent, I get that, but that's the properties we've got. That's the properties that exist in the borough. That's the problem that we've got. And this is great. This is a shed in the back of a garden. It was occupied, I think it was two people, wasn't it? And they had to ask permission to go to the toilet in the main house. They had to knock on the door and ask permission. That's right, wasn't it, Ian? Yeah, ask permission to go to the toilet. In London, in the greatest city in the world, asking permission to go to the toilet. Rear garden structure, five unrelated tenants living together with no heating provision. And in many of these, in many of these places, they're simply tapped into the gas, the water, the electricity. It's immensely dangerous to the people living there. And, you know, just not acceptable. Dump rubbish and furniture, the result of what we get, they're common in all parts of the borough. You've only got to live in this borough to know that that's the case. And I was watching um, a number of my, there's a number of, councillors here tonight, um, I'll ask them, does that sound right to you? Yeah? Yes. Councillors that are here, any problems with anything I've said? You live here, you live in the wards, you get people coming, get a lot of people coming in, talking to you about the problems of private rented? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but if anybody doesn't agree there's a councillor here, stand up. I mean, I'm welcome. Admittedly, they're all the same party as me, but <laughs> this is something that we spent a lot of time on and we've got very concerned about. Right. The landlord business is big business, an annual turnover of £300 million plus in Newham, and over a third of this is financed by the public sector, with over 13,000 households and landlords receiving £120 million per annum in state support. And I believe it is reasonable to expect some clear basic standards. The question is, obviously, how do we do that? How do we get to the bad landlords, and ideally, not inconvenience the good landlords? Because I have no interest no interest at all in tying up good landlords and red tape and cost. I am not interested in that. Some of it may be unavoidable, but I really want to minimise that. And that's one of the things I want to consult as we're, we're talking on consultation. Our, yeah, one of the challenges that's been put to me is that we should look to deliver our objective via a voluntary scheme. Well, there are in excess of 4,000 landlords operating, operating in the borough, and yet only 10% of these are accredited via any of the national voluntary schemes. So, I'm sorry, the voluntary approach 
isn't going to work sufficiently. I think that's been for 10 years now, and so we'd certainly encourage it. We encourage people to join, and if I was asked, any landlord, I'd say join the NLA or, or a similar body. It's a really good thing to do, absolutely the right thing to do, but it's not going to solve our problems. Our approach has been to respond to these challenges in a proportionate way that addresses the concerns of tenants and the wider community, but also recognises the contribution of good landlords. Now, at present, we operate two schemes. The mandatory licensing of HMOs, that's in place across the country, and selective licensing declared in March, uh, March 2010 in Little Elford Ward is still, we think, the first and only 100% licensing area in London. Is that right? We think it's still, yeah. Uh, we call it a neighbourhood improvement zone, and it combined landlord licensing with a variety of other tools and initiatives to improve the area. So we didn't just do licensing, we brought everything together in a real concerted way by the council to make sure that we could get the benefit of what we were doing. We introduced it as a pilot, and we think it's been a tremendous success. Certainly the people that live in Little Ilford think it's been a tremendous success. There are 257 private rented properties in the NIZ. Of these, around a third signed up immediately um, for, for licensing. Immediately. And um, perhaps some of you here? Anybody here that signed up for Little Ilford? Okay, never mind. Um, with work, another, thing, another third signed up. So we've got two thirds signed up. And as of October, 235 residential properties were licensed. That left a final hardcore group of 22 landlords who failed to engage with Newham and 30 landlords have been or are being prosecuted for failure to licence. We've inspected almost every one of the rented uh, homes with around 100 requiring wider improvements to be made through enforcement notices. So that's enforcement arriving over a third of the properties needed to be improved. Now, one of the key advantages of this approach was that it's given us a tool to identify and engage the non-cooperative landlords that simply isn't there with voluntary schemes. And it also complements wider intervention in the sector that in isolation don't always deliver the effective outcomes we're aiming for. Um, I think it's true to say that, I mean, Ian Dick there um, works for us in the private rental. I think I've spent years railing about how we get and deal with the problems, how we try and get involved, how we deal with properties. And for years we've attempted to do individual properties. We've attempted to, 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 to line things up, and it hasn't worked. It just hasn't worked, and it's not that we haven't tried. And Ian will be able to tell you, I have railed at it for years, and it's this that's been the first thing that's given us any success. Um, rent repayment orders allow the council to recover up to 12 months of state-funded rent from non-compliant landlords, providing HB and LHAs in payment. We've had four cases heard, and a further 20 are expected. We recently won a case whereby a landlord had to repay £6,500 in rent and £6,000 in costs. Where rogue portfolio landlords are seen to have gained from the criminal activity of receiving income from rents where rents are not payable, we are making applications for confiscation orders under the Proceeds of Crime Act, and our first order was granted in October 2011. And I think that's an important point, that if we're using the Proceeds of Crime Act, that gives you a sense of the people we're trying to deal with with this. That gives you a sense of where we're trying to go and what we're trying to do to stop people who frankly bring the sector into disrepute. And if we don't do it, what will the calls be later on as this becomes more and more public? Because it's getting more and more public. There's been a lot of activity on television recently about some of the problems that have come up. So as this expands, and as people see it, and lots of people don't see it yet, but they're, they're starting to, what is that going to lead to in terms of demands, given the, link, the, the, the criminal nature of some of the things that are going on? Um, but I also think the scheme brings good benefits for, la for good landlords, right? You walk around the streets of Little Ilford and they are improved. Indeed, we have one of our councillors from Little Ilford here this evening. Um, and the area is once again one that aspirational families might look to move to. And that's got a positive impact on the value of landlords' investments. And we're very much supportive of that. We want to see that happen. Now, you'll ask why, given the success, um, that, that, that which was, when, when you support a target scheme, why are we taking a blanket approach? And the answer is that although the problems in Little Ilford are severe, they are not untypical of Newham. We considered a hotspot type approach. We looked at that. We did say, could we look at a hotspot approach? Identifying neighbourhoods where there were particular problems. But if you think back to the map I showed, the private rented sector has grown across Newham. When we analysed associated issues, overcrowding, antisocial behaviour, noise nuisance, we also saw that these issues were evenly distributed and affects every ward.